At Walmart, we're always looking at ways to lower costs, but we have to do it the right way. Working towards our sustainability goals is a way to achieve that. We're not only doing what's right for the planet, but we're running a better business. Our customers have high expectations. They expect us to deliver them value, and they ex expect us to deliver them quality. They also expect us to do it in a way that's good for the environment. Just imagine if we worked really closely with our suppliers to improve how much waste is in the system, how they use water in their processes and fertilizer. It really, really breeds a much more healthy environment when we engage our suppliers and think about our members. I think it's an infectious thing and um, everybody can make a difference in the same way they can saving costs. There's lots of small actions that can make a difference, there are big corporate decisions that can make a difference, but everybody can be involved in it. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Great to have you guys at our uh, building in, in, uh, in uh, we call it ISD, so that may not make sense, I, uh, Technology Center. Um, it's wonderful to have, Laura, you with us um, at, at this wonderful show, at this milestone for uh, sustainability. You know, um, I wanted to share something. As you watched that video, there was a lot of discussion about eliminating waste, increasing efficiency. That's what the sustainability is all about. With that said, one of the ways IT is helping uh, with that, Laura, is this idea of increasing, uh, putting mobility into the hands of the associates in our clubs and stores. Um, you probably heard a lot about that, um, what they're doing with the cap process, all these different system, systems out there. What you may not know is who are the associates that are actually doing it. Well, that's great. And you know, this meeting today is all about two things. Number one, it's about our associates. We have amazing associates all throughout our business, all around the world, in every business segment, doing incredible work in the business, also with business results and sustainability results. This meeting is also about innovation. And we're going to highlight our associates around the world and the innovation and the way they're working together to solve big challenges, both in the business that also have sustainability business, uh, impact. So we're going to kick it off. Uh, with our first team we're going to recognize today. And why don't you bring them on up? Sure. I've got the uh, team that helped develop, uh, uh, design, develop, and deploy, and support all our mobile devices in that store. So guys, come on up. Welcome. Welcome. Give me a W. 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 Give me an A. Hey. A. Give me an L. L. Give me a squiggly. Squiggly. Give me an M. M. Give me an A. A. Give me an R. R. Give me a T. T. What's that spell? Walmart. Who's Walmart is it? <laughs> Who's number one? The customer. Always. Ooh. All right. Thank you guys. Great job. <laughs> Laura, we leave it up to you. All right. Thank you, Paul and the ISD mobile team who worked really hard to develop innovation with hardware and software to bring new practices into our stores that make our associates more productive, help us to save costs and to be more efficient. That's awesome work. Great associates really leading with innovation. Well, my name is Laura Phillips and I am just really pleased to be here with you guys today at our sustainability showcase meeting. So welcome to many of you. There's a few in the back. And so there's some extra room uh, sitting. Uh, I see some chairs. If you guys want to uh, scooch in or hold your hand up, and we'll make sure we get the rest of you in. Um, but welcome uh, to our meeting today in a great month of Earth Month. We're here today to really pause for a little while in this uh, Earth Month to recognize the work that we've been doing along our sustainability journey on the past 10 years to highlight the work that's happening today with real associates driving real change around using data and innovation to really drive business impact for customers, for associates, for cost reduction around innovation and new products that really fit and really meet customer demand, and also that have an environmental and a social benefit. So what we're going to do today is we're going to hear those stories, celebrate those associates, and then we're also going to hear a little bit about the future. How are we starting to think about what's next? What are those challenges we should all be thinking about? How should we be thinking about sustainability and what we do in our world, in our work every day? Doug is here uh, today with us, and he's going to host a panel of some leaders that we have in town for this event today. You know, we couldn't do this work in sustainability by ourselves. We have been really lucky to have great partners with us for many years along the journey. We're working with these partners on the ground, we're working on innovation together, and we're working to drive change together. 
In fact, in the room today, we have many of our suppliers with us. So welcome to our suppliers. And you'll meet three of our supplier uh, CEOs and leaders coming up on a panel with Doug. Also in the room today, we have many of our NGO partners. And these are partners that help advise us along challenges in the environment and in our supply chains. And so I want to help welcome uh, Environmental Defense, World, uh, uh, WD WWF, and the Nature Conservancy for being here with us today. We really appreciate your partnership uh, and work with us today. So with that, I'm excited to start the meeting officially and to start celebrating great work that our associates are doing. But first, I'm going to take you back in time. About 10 years ago, you know, we recognized after Hurricane Katrina that we could use our strengths to drive impact and really make change to help others when we really were able to deliver impact in that region that helped that community in a real way. Around that time, we launched three big ambitious goals. One, to really be powered by renewable waste in the, uh, by renewable energy in the future. Number two, have zero waste. And number three, to sell products that sustain people and the environment. We have made great progress along those goals. And in fact, in October, we celebrated how we've really made progress against those goals. I would tell you, the work continues. It's hard. There are challenges ahead of us that we'll all need to continue to work on together. Over the last several months, as we've really looked at this work, we looked at it and said, what's really allowed us to make all of that change into the, in uh, the last 10 years? And I would tell you what it is, is it's our associates. Um, we have so many associates doing great work. This is a part of their day job. And in fact, you're going to see in today's meeting, sustainability is everybody's business because it's good for business. So with that, we're going to highlight a handful of associate stories. We picked 10 to talk about today. I would tell you there's about 110,000. Um, and so uh, we want to just highlight a few, and we'll learn more about them. Uh, and we'll start with that first. So if you would, roll the video. Mr. Sam always said, at Walmart, one man or one woman can affect the future. Today, we are celebrating associates who bring this statement to life. Their commitment and passion for sustainable practices are impacting millions of people. The renewable energy team led a project to enable Walmart to purchase renewable electricity from a wind farm in Texas that will supply more than 25% of the electricity needed for 350 stores, clubs, and DCs. Ronnie and Brian trained more than 500 factories in China to reduce energy usage in order to lower product costs and decrease pollution in China. Jason developed a new tool to right-size the number of shipping cartons from apparel suppliers, reducing the number of cartons used by over 8 million in 2015, resulting in lower costs and less environmental impact. The associates at club number 4870 from Kansas City, Kansas, worked together towards their commitment to reducing waste, supporting Feeding America, and achieving their club's sustainability goals. Stephen is the community champion in our Boston, UK store. Stephen helped develop an in-store customer engagement program to educate shoppers on how to reduce food waste at home and helped save our customers money. Through extensive collaboration across Walmart Technology in Bentonville, San Bruno, and in our e-commerce fulfillment centers, this team led a project to leverage new technology solutions to solve business and environmental challenges by reducing the cubic volume of our customer order cartons by 7.2 million cubic feet annually. This team led a project to convert date labels in our private brand products at Walmart US and Sam's Club to best if used by date labels that are designed to be easier for customers to understand and are helping to reduce food waste. Operations and merchandising collaborated together to get changes to egg packaging and processes in stores that prevented over 35 million eggs from being thrown away in 2015. The beef merchants and sustainability teams in Walmart Brazil led a collaborative effort to create a new Brazil beef monitoring system, which is designed to source beef that doesn't impact the Amazon rainforest. Corey and Sean led a cross-functional effort to create improved formulations for cleaning, personal care, beauty, pets, and baby products in Walmart US and Sam's Club. This has resulted in our suppliers removing 95% of the high-priority chemicals identified by weight from these products. We celebrate these and many other associates who are sparking positive change, creating enthusiasm, and inspiring others to continue extraordinary work for Walmart, for their world, and for future generations.
That's outstanding. Now, in fact, we have many of those leaders here with us today. So I would ask if you were highlighted on the video or have been recognized and a sustainability leader, please stand up and let us help to congratulate you, to salute you, and to really honor the great work that you guys are doing. You'll notice in the video we also called out a handful of our associates in Walmart International who are also doing great work. Several of them are on the line today, and so we know we have Natalie and the Walmart Brazil beef merchants uh, who are out there who have really led work in Brazil around a beef supply chain that is free from risk of deforestation, and also our team in China who's worked with over 500 factories to reduce uh, energy and emissions in China. And so thank you guys. Uh, thanks for being on, even though there's a very different time zone, and we appreciate the work that you're doing there. So great work from everybody. And again, we have lots of stories that we can tell. But you'll see how all of the work is really focused around driving business impact. It's good for business. It's good for customers. It's good for waste and reduction of cost. And it's also providing real environmental uh, benefits across the range of issues that we've discussed. We're going to now take three examples and go a little bit deeper. So the first one I want to uh, appreciate is on the Walmart tech team. Um, if I could have Justin join me up on stage. All right. Yes. Welcome to Justin. Thank you. So Justin uh, works in our e-commerce division, and uh, you're in our operations team, yep. right? All right. So Justin's team was faced with a challenge. And I would tell you, it was a customer challenge. And uh, customers were giving us feedback that we could do better on our cartons and our shipping boxes um, from Walmart.com. So Justin, why don't you talk about how did, you, how did you assemble this team and start to work against this customer challenge? Well, thanks, Laura. As you stated, it really didn't start out as a sustainability initiative. It was really a, a customer initiative, and we were seeking feedback from customers how we could improve the online shopping experience. And although we didn't specifically ask it, as we were looking for customer feedback, customers were telling us time and time again that there was a lot of waste in our packaging. In fact, you know, they care as much about sustainability as we do, and it really surprised us. So as we got more and more data that pointed us that direction, we quickly realized that, hey, we've got to put some work against to solve this. And if you look at the packaging we had before, there was a lot of air and there was a lot of dunnage. So a, a package going to a customer's home would contain a lot of excess waste. And so what we did was we took the small team that was working on customer insights and we kind of farmed them out and had a really collaboration group across many different teams. So it started out with uh, the team in San Bruno, and then we added a few engineers from the home office and logistics building, and then we brought in some of the field engineers out in the FCs, and then we incorporated several of the operations buildings. And so it started as a small team, and then it moved across several different groups. And what we did was first we tested uh, just a few orders and said, let's look at feedback and get back from the customer. And if you will, I'll show you a quick example. Oh, that'd be great. All right. So if you don't mind, hold that for me. A new fry frying pan. <laughs> So if you, if you go back a year ago, and one of our customers would have ordered a, a, a frying pan, a single frying pan, this would have been the only box, the example we would have had to ship. That's a that big box in. for that frying pan that then I would have to receive and throw away and store. And, and there would be a lot of dunnage in there, too, yeah. to protect the it's frying pan. It's expensive to ship that box around. Absolutely. So what you generally think about with sustainability is less is more. In this case, more is less. So by adding more box options, we could reduce the overall footprint of what we shipped. So what we did was take 
went from an option of 12, we increased the number of boxes to 27, and through that effort, we reduced the overall air, air we ship by 30%. So the overall reduction annualized, as the video said, was 7.2 million cubic feet of packaging in a single year. And something we haven't really measured yet, but if you can imagine filling a truckload of outbound orders, so by reducing the air by 30%, for every three outbound trucks we ship, one goes away. So it's two for three. So there's also other savings that we'll reap the benefit That's of. That's right. Great job, and we want to give a shout out to the team in San Bruno. I think we have a couple of them out there. Jonathan uh, is out there, right? Jonathan Drake really headed up the project. Yeah, so oh, Jonathan, if we great could credit, and also the team here. Oh, that there's on Jonathan. It. Okay, great job. <laughs> Greetings from sunny California. All right. So, some of the rest of the team is here as well. Great job, we and we have others in San Bruno watching in different locations, but we appreciate the work, the partnership. This really highlights new ways of working, taking on customer challenges, and then seeing the benefits of that in the business and in sustainability. Awesome job, great job. Thank you, Laura. All right. All right, next, come on up. All right, the next story we want to highlight is on our apparel team, and uh, this is Jason. Jason is in our replenishment division, and Jason, why don't you talk about the challenge that you saw and how you worked with your team to create a solution? Mm, sure. So about a year and a half ago, uh, we met with a supplier, Garen, who um, came to us with an opportunity within their supply chain. Their case sizes were too small, kind of the opposite of what we're talking about here. <laughs> <clears throat> but what they told us that they were creating inefficiencies within their supply chain. We were handling boxes too much at their factories, but also in our DCs. So the other part of that is the environmental impact. Smaller boxes actually create more corrugate. So we went back, we tested, we started uh, talking with Garen, how do we increase our pack sizes? Successful test, then we started looking at the data as well to see how big across, to this, about, across the apparel was this. And so what we found was is about 70% of our cases that we were shipping in apparel was on the same scenario, too small. So we immediately knew we had to go after it fast. And so we created a tool, simple, nothing pretty, went out to the buyers, they, they embraced it. We put an associate towards that tool who was very passionate, was our salesperson who took that. And then <clears throat> what we found out is well, now here we are. Eight million boxes we took out of the supply chain for the fashion network. Of that eight million boxes, we had a six million pound reduction in corrugate. Huge reductions through a simple process of just giving the team a tool to make the right decision. That's an awesome story. Great job. Great impact. All right, and the great, great work to that team um, and really kind of highlights the story of this is everybody's business. Next, we're gonna go a uh, special treat. We're gonna go uh, kind of north of here a little bit to Kansas City to Sam's Club number 4870. Are you guys out there? All right. Yes, we are, Laura, how are you? <laughs> That's awesome. All right, so we've got Keith and we've got Kelvin, right? Keith is our club manager and Kelvin is our regional. Now you guys uh, have won the Project SAM Award, which is Sustainability Always Matters, and uh, have done a lot of extra work in the club. Why don't you guys tell us a little bit about what you've done, and by the way, congratulations for winning that club out of all of the SAMS Club. Well done. Well, well thank you, Laura. Uh, and Thank you very much, and I I'm excited to be here with Keith and his team to celebrate that major accomplishment. Um, as you know, sustainability is really important to the Sam's Club enterprise. It's obviously important to Keith and his team today, where I am in Kansas City, but it's also important for all the clubs across the chain. And what we're finding is that our members really appreciate our work in this space. So anytime we can do something that advances our members' interests, it's a good thing for the company. Now, there are three criteria that are used to determine the Sustainability Club of the Year. The first has to do with donating eligible items to local food banks and reducing food waste. The second is saving energy. And the final is getting associates to embrace these sustainability principles in their personal lives so that there's no disconnect when they come to work. It's just a natural extension of what they already do. And Keith's team has exceeded on all of those. 
So we are excited about his accomplishment, and they deserve the right to be considered Sustainability Club of the Year, Laura. Great job. So Keith, tell us how did you do this, and how do you motivate and align uh, your, uh, your associates and your members around all of the work that you're doing? Sure, absolutely. First of all, I'd like to just thank you all for the recognition. Uh, it's a humble award to get this uh, recognition. Uh, I would tell you we've got goals in the club that basically we want to have a positive impact on our business. We want to impact our lives, our associates, and also want to impact the community that we, we live in. Um, and it's as simple as getting our associates involved. Uh, we ask them to take ownership in it and do what they would do on the inside uh, of the club, same as they would do it at home. You don't leave your freezer door at home. You don't leave it open in the club, and that just helps us control things. Uh, secondly, we do a lot of things outside. My team's very strong uh, about getting involved and in helping in the community. Uh, we do things like going to a boys camp uh, that helps to uh, plant trees, do some shrubs, uh, clean up. And then finally, we take some uh, personal sustainability routes where, uh, for instance, I have 30 people that help in a MS bike ride every year where we ride over 168 miles in two days. Uh, and that just shows uh, our commitment towards trying to help improve people's lives. That's great. So help me um, congratulate. I would also oh, tell you that the, owner <laughs> right. the ownership would, would come from basically the time we hire them. We ask for the commitment um, from day one to uh, get involved. Uh, and my PTC does a great job following up on that. Oh, that's great. Well, we really appreciate the work. You guys have done outstanding work. We're humbled by your work and what you guys are doing with your associates and your members up in Kansas City. So we see that it's great for uh, your associates, but we also know that his club is doing well, and he has great engagement with his members and his associates in that club. So great job. So hopefully you can see from all these stories, this is what Walmart's all about. Great people doing great work, really driving impact in the business and driving impact in society. This is all the way from our buyers to our store managers, our engineers, our truck drivers, all of the great associates in this room, we are honored and humbled by what you guys are doing, and we want you to keep it up. So you're going to hear more about what the future looks like. And I'm going to welcome up at this time Kathleen McLaughlin, who is president of the Walmart Foundation and chief sustainability officer, to talk about how are we really taking the work we've been doing, really continuing to drive impact, and taking it into the future. Kathleen, welcome. Thank you, Laura. I'm so delighted to be here today and so proud of all the work of our associates. You know, this is an incredible, incredible company, and it always has been incredible since day one. There's been a lot of talk uh, lately about what's the role of business in communities. How can we help our communities? And next week, we're going to be publishing our annual Global Responsibility Report. This is something we come out with every year. comes out the same day as our annual report. And it's where we get a chance to talk about the stories you just heard and then some. Everything that we're doing around the world in sustainability and some other things. And you know, when it comes to the difference that Walmart makes in the lives of people every day, the most important thing is our business. It's what we're doing every single day to help people save money and live better. The hundreds of millions of customers that we're serving all over the world, uh, not only through our stores these days, but through e-commerce. And that's really where it all begins. What's exciting, though, is what we're doing and hearing about today, our ability to take our strengths and use them even beyond our business to help other people. And that's really what this Global Responsibility Report talks about. So I would really encourage you next week, April 20th, download it. It'll be online. You can get hard copies in, in the home office. Um, please take a look at it. Read it. Share it with your friends. Share it with your family. We want to spread the word about stories like you're hearing today, what Walmart is doing. I want to give you a little taste of what this report's going to cover. If we can bring up the slide. So there are three big areas that we talk about um, how we make a difference even beyond our day-to-day -day business. The first is opportunity. So we make such a difference, certainly in the lives of ourselves and our fellow associates all around the world, but even beyond that, we're doing amazing things around the world to help create opportunity for other people to move up in life. Whether it's our veterans programs, our work in retail in general, we're doing a lot of work through the foundation well beyond Walmart to help people in retail move from that first job to something you know, even bigger and better over time. We're doing a lot of work through Sam's Club, Sam's Giving, uh, helping small businesses and people get a start in life that way. Everything we're doing in our own company around diversity and inclusion, these are just examples. And you'll, you can see those in the report. 
The second big area that we focus in opportunity is using our purchase order to make a difference. So think about what we're doing through women's economic empowerment, supporting women-owned businesses, right? Or the work that we're doing around the world with smallholder farmers, helping them connect to global markets, helping them have better livelihoods. And that's everything from IPL working in Kenya on passion fruit to our folks in Mexico working on tomatoes, you name it. We're really making a difference in the lives of farmers around the world. So those are just a couple of the ways that we make a difference. And of course, in this country, we have local manufacturing, right? Our US manufacturing commitment. So opportunity, big, big theme for us. Second one is the one we're here to talk about today, which is sustainability. And you know, 10 years ago, as Laura said, we had those three big goals, energy, waste, and more sustainable products. Well, we're as committed to that today as we ever were. And what started out as a focus on energy in our own operations has expanded to working on energy and emissions reduction across our whole supply chain. So we're working with farmers to reduce emissions on the field. We're working with things like laundry compaction, cold water wash, LED light bulbs to try to help consumers reduce emissions. So end to end from production all the way to consumers. This is a big deal for Walmart and we're recognized globally for the work that we've been doing on climate. So that's really exciting. Second is waste. You know, again, we're still at it in our own operations. We're at about 82% waste reduction in the US. That's great. Uh, we got a long ways to go to get that last 18%. But this is another one. Beyond our four walls, we're doing a lot to reduce waste. Upstream, purchasing the whole crop instead of leaving the uglier vegetables behind. Downstream, you know, investing in things like the closed loop recycling fund. And we've got a number of the suppliers here with us today who helped us get that going. So thank you to you guys. So whether it's upstream in our own operations, downstream recycling, recycled content, labeling about how to recycle, you can read about all of these in the report, so please do have a look at that. That's a, that's a big focus for us. Third is natural resources. We've been at it for a while on deforestation, working on palm, on soy, on Brazilian beef. You heard the example there. Thank you to the folks in Brazil for helping us work on deforestation in that way. We're working on water. We're working on land conservation. Last fall, we told you about our Acres for America program, where Walmart has helped conserve one million acres of land in this country. That's over 10 acres for every acre of land we ever developed. That's incredible. So that's a big one. Food. Everything from the hunger relief program you just heard about through, through SAMS, to helping people access food through our own store network, to sustainable food production, to waste reduction in food, to healthier food. We've taken out sodium and salt and trans fats from our products and worked with suppliers to do that too. So just incredible what we've been doing around food. Transparency and quality, everything from food safety to the chemicals reduction initiative. I mean, Corey and Sean, that just blows me away, that we've taken out 95% of the weight of chemicals of concern from products. That's actually the story that got me to join Walmart. It was the week that that story came out in the newspaper, and I read that, and I was in the recruiting process, and I thought, okay, that's it. I have to go to this company. That we could make a difference on an issue like that, that people have been working on for 40 years trying to do the regulation, but thanks to the collaboration with suppliers and your leadership, we just did it. It's an incredible story. Worker safety and dignity. So you probably have seen a lot about what we've been doing in Bangladesh through responsible sourcing, and Jan will, will talk about that a bit. Amazing story there around improving factory safety. And now we're starting to work on other things too. So stay tuned on that. We talk about it in the report. You're gonna hear more and more about that. And then finally, communities. I mean, we're in 10,000 communities around the world. We are part of these communities. Our 2.3 million associates live and work in these communities, and we make such a difference through our store engagement, through philanthropy, store grants, and so on, and then also through disaster relief, which comes full circle right to where Laura started, and that was Katrina 10 years ago, and what an impact that had on us as a company and helped us realize what a difference we can make when we use our strengths to help other people. So it's an amazing company. We should be really proud to work for a company like this. Thank you for everything you do because there isn't a person in this room who isn't involved in some way in these areas and through our core business helping hundreds of millions of folks every day. So thank you for all that you do. Please take a look at the report. Give us feedback as you read it. We want to hear about it. We want to make it better and better and, uh, and tell these stories more beyond the walls of Walmart. So 
With that, I have the honor of introducing Mr. Doug McMillan, our CEO. Doug, thanks for being with us here today. Thanks, nice job. Good afternoon. I want to take this chance to thank Dan and Kathleen and Laura for your leadership and the entire sustainability team for everything that you're doing. Speaking of the sustainability team, would you raise your hand if you're a member? Okay, right now, every single hand it should be in the air. <laughs> this is the first test question. We have a really small and mighty sustainability team for a reason, and that is because we want every single person in the company looking for an idea that you can implement, you can do, that'll make a difference across the scale of the company. So when you walk out of here today, think of yourself that way. Um, I get to have a conversation today, which I'm looking forward to, and I'll introduce a few people to get started. First, I'll start with the chairman and CEO of Kellogg's. Please welcome John Bryant up here today. John. <laughs> Thanks, man. Just sit in where. Dave McLennan from Cargill. Dave is the chairman and CEO of Cargill. Please welcome Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. And we have the vice chairman and chief scientific officer for PepsiCo. How cool does that sound? <laughs> Mahmoud Khan. Dr. Khan, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure to have you. <clears throat> Greg, we don't have a chief scientific officer yet, do we? <laughs> Are you it? Mm, maybe. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask all of you to answer this first question, and then after that, we'll just wing it, okay? Um, okay? It would be, tell us a little bit about how you've woven sustainability into your business, and maybe give us one example, your favorite example of, of stories like the ones that we've been sharing today from your company. And John, we'll just start with you and come to Sure. Way. Well, we, we have, when we do our strategy house as a company, we have two sides of the house. One side is, you know, as you expect, winning breakfast, snacks, et cetera. And the other side is who we are. And a core pillar of who we are is our sustainability practices. And so it is an, an integral element of the total company strategy. And then we try to bring that to life inside the company by telling various stories about the things that our, our employees do. Now, not every employee has the opportunity to do this, but we sent some of our cashy team to Bolivia to work with quinoa farmers and improve the sustainability of those farmers. But also what they did is they left behind solar panels to give <coughs> um, access to electricity for those, for those farmers. That, not, that enabled them both in their individual farming practices, but also gave their kids the opportunity to study at night. So these practices don't just change how people farm, it changes their lives. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It reminds me of the system-wide solution, You know, thinking about the whole picture, not just one piece. Dave. I would say, Doug, that I did not imagine, I've been CEO for about two years, I had no idea at the time when I came in how much sustainability would be part of our, of my job and of our story. And I think from everything from recruiting, I think a generation of millennials, they expect a company like, like everyone represented here to be focusing on sustainability, to be doing good things for the planet, but it's, it's an inextricable part of our business model, everything from being a signatory to the soy moratorium, we won't buy soybeans in, the, in Brazil from anybody who's deforested within a certain period of time. And the story that I, one of the stories that's similar to John's is we are uh, in the cocoa and chocolate business. And we have something in West Africa, Ghana, and Ivory Coast where most of the world's cocoa is sourced called the Cargill Cocoa Promise. And we will certify co-ops who raise their cocoa sustainably and also safely, meaning we don't want them using machetes to crack open the pods but how they use fertilizer and water, and we will pay them a premium if they raise their cocoa in a sustainable way. So since then, we've paid about 7 million euros in premium for sustainably raised cocoa. And I was at a village recently where one of our co-ops raises the cocoa, and I saw a, a nurse's office, a school, and a bank that they had built with the premium from raising sustainable cocoa. So we all know when you travel, the impact that you all have on people's lives, but to see that firsthand that if you can, you can, it's not incompatible with a successful business model, but it changes the trajectory of those that need it the most. Very cool story. Thank you. The Cocoa Promise. Cargo, Cargo Cocoa it's kind of fun promise. to say. The it's Cargo got a little Cocoa alliteration promise. in there, yeah, it's catchy. Don't use a machete. Don't we, we use sticks. It's but, a rule yeah. for all of us. <laughs> remember that. We don't that. want anybody using a machete for anything. There's one thing you remember, take that home with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mahmoud, how about PepsiCo? Well, about 10 years ago, we articulated uh, a vision 
uh, by Indra, our CEO and chairman at the time, is performance with purpose. And so to us, it's not just the fact that we have to perform. Every company does. It's not about making money. That's the performance side. It's about the purpose as well, which is the how we make money. And that has just become part of the fabric and the DNA of the company. It's not a strategy group. It's not a sustainability group. Every single business unit and every single business review is about what's your performance and what's the purpose part of it. And I think when you do that, and given the scale of our company, that changes not only how we work, but our entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So I can give, to give you literally hundreds of stories, but let me give you one global example. We've been able to reduce our water use in our operations, in our direct operations, by 20% for every unit of production. If you think about global scale, and we've created uh, manufacturing plants that have zero water discharge, zero liquid discharge from that entire production unit, created manufacturing lines that are completely solar powered. Now, it's always good to be recognized, but last year, about a year ago, we got the Stockholm Water Prize, which, lead, which is recognition of the leadership in the entire industry for what we do. So it was good for a purpose side, but it was also good for our business because it really went right down to the bottom line. You it bet. Is, Great story. Um, two years ago, we had a small group of companies uh, that we invited to come together. These companies were in that group, and it, it was a small group. Ken Powell was here from General Mills earlier. He was another one. And um, we talked about what we could do to work together to drive sustainability in a different way. And we see each other fairly frequently at different venues around the world and, and interact with government leaders. And sometimes it gets bogged down in bureaucracy and gets too broad. And we get frustrated that not, a lot, not, a lot, not enough progress is being made. So what we agreed together two years ago is that we would decide one thing that we were going to go do differently together. And the thing that we chose was related to row crop production, specifically in the Midwest, Nebraska, Iowa, and Illinois. Um, Dan and Kathleen and Fred Krupp, uh, Krupp from EDF and I and, and some others went to Ames, Iowa this summer. And we walked in some fields with farmers and learned about cover crops and uh, proper fertilization and um, things like that. It was fun hanging out with the farmers. And they're quite sophisticated, really, the group that we met. And since um, we've been working together, we've formulated a plan. And today, we spent an hour and a half or so talking about what it is we're going to go do next. And I thought you guys might just comment on that effort and tell us a little bit about what you're doing to help make this happen. And it, you don't have to all three speak, but whoever <laughs> feels led. Well, I, I think it's a great initiative. You know, uh, we are, we're all committed to making a difference in our end-to-end -end supply chains, from the farms all the way through to the consumer's home. We will get a lot further if we work together than if we try to work as individual companies. So what is powerful is Walmart's initiative here to bring us all together to work on one individual opportunity that is a massive and significant change opportunity. So we look at it as, as a great test case of what we can do beyond just individual companies, but as an, as an entire end-to-end -end supply chain. So I think it's a very exciting initiative and a great opportunity for us to flex our total muscles as a supply chain. Me too. Well, I appreciate your calling us here two years ago and then coming back together two years later to talk about row crops, an area where we all together, between Kellogg's, General Mills, it was also a very diverse group which had NGOs, Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, and the, um, who am I forgetting? EDF, sorry, yeah. Environmental Defense Fund. Fred, sorry, I got it. <laughs> a little old, things come back a little slowly. Environmental Defense Fund. But it's a, it's a, a collaboration amongst NGOs, retailers, manufacturers. We're in the ag and food business. Something that we do at Cargill is called Next Field, which is working with farmers to help them map their soil in, in terms of how much fertilizer do they need. And, and a big issue relative to environmental sustainability as many of you know, is excess nutrient runoff into water tables, into rivers and waterways, which has created a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So one of the things that we think we can collectively as a group and something that we're doing at Cargill is work with farmers in terms of mapping, using technology, using drones, using satellite technology to map their field, to map their acreage, to say, you don't need as much water here. You need a little more fertilizer here, but not so much here. To have a more efficient usage 
of natural resources in order to help them with efficiency gains, but also to be more environmentally sensible and environmentally sustainable. Yeah, Dave, that dead zone in the Gulf is the size of New Jersey? Yeah. Get your mind around that for a yeah. second. Um, you may have read in the papers about a lawsuit in Des Moines related to water quality. Um, water quality is becoming a really big issue. Um, Minnesota's got, you know, it's a land of 10,000 lakes. 20% yep. of the lakes in Minnesota at this point are not drinkable. Exactly. And it's related to the issue that Dave just described. This is real, and sometimes it doesn't feel like it's that real until it touches you personally. This is touching people personally in this country in a in a real way. We don't, we don't have all day. Our clocks are ticking here on, on trying to make a difference. Well, let me build on that. Look, many of us in this room are not just thinking about today, but we're parents and grandparents. And there's seven and a half billion people on the planet today. By 2050, well in the lifetime of our children, there'll be nine to nine and a half billion, two billion more people to feed. If we continue doing what we're doing today, we actually do not have a sustainable planet for our children. Now, while what we're talking about here is not going to change the planet, in my mind, as a scientist, this is a pilot of what is possible. And if we can be successful showing that all the different players can collaborate, work together, get over the barriers, and bring scale together, it's going to teach not only us, but it teaches the world of what we can do and how we can lead. You know, we, we are living in a climate of finding differences. Actually, this is an opportunity to show you we're all in it together. And what more timely, given some of the conversations we're hearing, we're not opposed to each other. We've got to do this together for everybody's good. And in my mind, most of all, for our children's good. Mm -hmm. They're going to inherit this. Can we Jeff. wing it, Doug? Or you, yeah, you go wanna, for it. No, I'm just I just wanted, I think it's a great point and very well said about generational succession. And I think the millennial generation of whom I can see in the room there are many, you're, you're going to be a, you already are a much better steward of the environment than my generation, I'm a late baby boomer, has been. And in part because you're more aware, you're more uh, well connected. And I just think you're more conscious about it. And I was at uh, the University of Virginia Business School last week and gave a presentation on Cargill and just some of my beliefs on leadership. And two of the questions that I got right out of the gates were about animal welfare. So people want to know, where's my food coming from? Who are the companies that make it? And what kind of company are they? And what are you doing on sustainability? I've never gotten those questions in an academic environment before. So a millennial generation, is, and to Mahmoud's point, is far more aware and I think will have, be more acute in terms of thinking, what do we need to do to sustain the planet for our kids and grandchildren? Mm -hmm. John, you cracked me up earlier today when you said, you know, people don't think big companies do good things. We just need to tell them all we're good people. <laughs> <laughs> We've tried that, uh, like you have. Didn't work so much. Uh, <laughs> Never give up, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But seriously, we can use scale individually and collectively to make a difference. And we had a good discussion today about, about customers and what we wish they knew. Right. Maybe we talk a little bit about that, because um, these are customers as well as associates, and they have families, and yeah. they'll help carry the message. What do we wish people knew about GMOs or sustainable farming or Fertilizers. Let me, let me take. This is one of the challenges that we have, right? I mean, we, we have a commitment as a company to work with 500,000 farmers on climate smart agricultural practices. Great commitment, but it's, it's a statistic. And until you put a human face on that, it doesn't resonate with consumers. But when you spend a day with a farmer, it changes your perspective on this opportunity. Because every, one of the, every farmer I've ever met deeply loves and is connected to, to his or her soil, farm. It is an important part of who they are. And so our opportunity here is to bring to life what we do in the agricultural system on a very personal basis. These are real people making real food for real consumers. And I think we're going to, we're going to keep dramatizing that and making that a reality for people. People talk about big ag. I can't find big ag. You go back on these farms, there are a bunch of farmers doing the best they can to make a difference. I think we, are tell, we have an opportunity to tell that story more effectively. Mm -hmm. Dr. Khan, what do you think about that? How does PepsiCo think about carrying the message and influencing the system? Well, I think there are two facets to this. One is, as an industry, 
there's no doubt, we have to evolve. Times have changed, and I'm a scientist. Our knowledge has changed. You know, so we cannot be judged today by the knowledge that is around us today and our past practices. They've evolved, and all of us are changing. Let's just think about this. Coming out of World War II in this country, the number one reason the US military couldn't find recruits is because American young men were underweight and undernourished. Mm. That was only 50 years ago. If you read the textbooks, that was the problem. So the US military went to the USDA and said, find a food system, develop a food system, and the regulatory environment to scale up food fast because it's a national security threat. Mm. Now, things have changed. And what happened yeah. is not, not, our have. Problem. not our problem anymore. OK? But <laughs> our industry responded to the environment we were in. This environment is different today. And I am a firm believer our industry will respond again. And it will continue to do so because 98% of the world's population buys its food from the private sector. There will always be a food industry. There will always be large players. We will be selling food. It might be different. It may be grown differently, may be manufactured differently. There may be new brands. At the end of the day, those who evolve, and PepsiCo, in our mind, we are leading the way to this transformation for many parts of our industry. We've been innovating. You said, you know, how cool is that? How many uh, of you would have thought an endocrinologist would be heading R&D for a food and beverage company? I'm not even sure what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're not my patient. Uh, <laughs> so is Doug. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, it's these new skills, new talents, new ideas. Look at the people you've recruited and some of the people we're speaking today. They're new to this industry. They're bringing new ideas, new thoughts. And that's what's exciting because our industry will respond, is responding, mm -hmm. and we will continue to grow and serve our customers. Customers that are demanding different things. That's all, it, it's going to be, and it's exciting. Yeah. We had, I think, Tony, it was your group, do some research, and 65% of customers at this point are saying, we want to know more about the food that we eat, understand where it comes from, et cetera. I imagine if you asked every customer, 100% of them would say that's true. I don't know why the survey missed 35% of them, but I want to know what I'm eating and where it came from and you know, want to be closer to source if possible. Um, any tips from your experience um, as to how to engage your own associates or employees. Um, how do you reach out to them? How do you try to light them all up so that they're all on the sustainability team? It's a great question. We, we, uh, just sitting here looking at some of your great examples that you have here, I wish I had a dozen examples like that. You know, our, our people are incredibly passionate about sustainability. There's a reason why people choose to work in the food industry. They, they believe in food and they want, to get, they, want to, they want to feed people and they want to have the whole system work well. So we're starting from a good place. We're starting with a group of people who are really passionate about this area. And then again, we tell those stories and engage them and put, put a human face on what we're doing back into our supply chain. And uh, you know, I, was, I was in San Jose last week out in California. We have a waffle facility out there. And they wanted to pioneer new technology so they have a new fuel cell technology out there to, to power that plant. And so we gave them the opportunity to go do that and know if making that a reality. Go do that somewhat sparingly from time to time, but that's a great example of engaging people and, and, mm -hmm. and labeling them to demonstrate their passion. Mm -hmm. You bet. M making waffles. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, I just think it's expected from a younger generation that that's what they're lo looking. More and more in a company, they're looking to a socially responsible uh, entity, organization that's doing good things on the planet. I think what you all did previously, uh, just a few minutes ago, about the stories, I think it's one story at a time. And I think you'd, it, you, it's an emotional topic, what people consume, what they put in their body. They want to know, what is it? What's it made from? Who made it? Do I trust them? How do they treat animals? Where was this grown? And it's a story that we've got to do a better job as an industry of telling. But I think through the stories, and I, just th I think through, a, I'll call it a general generational expectation, from a new generation is that's what they're looking for in a company. And whether it's recruiting at the University of Virginia or in interviews, those are the questions that I'm getting. What are you doing on sustainability? How do you treat the planet? How do you treat animals? I just, it's become more and more part of the culture, but this storytelling is a fantastic way uh, to knit together a company and knit together a culture. Mm -hmm. Let me just build on that and give an example. You know, it's, 
It's not what we say, but our associates see what we're doing. Yeah. And it's the doing that excites them, that engages them. We had a young group about six years ago come to myself and some of my peers and said, you know, Dr. Khan, do you realize that every summer there are millions of American school kids that don't get a meal any, uh, during the day because their main meal was their school meal? And when summer break comes, there's no school lunch, and that's, their meal is gone. And they said, we want to do something about it. And that was the genesis of what we call Food for Good. We had a great distribution system in those exact communities where they didn't get food. We took our different partners. We went to different partners and said, can you come together with us? And we launched a school, a lunch program over the summer, pro summer into every community. We started with Dallas and Austin. And last year, I think we served two or three million. All grew because this young group of kids I can call them kids, they're the same age as my children. They had the idea, but the bottom line I want to say is the senior management who have the resources and the ability to make the decision, it's our responsibility to support those ideas. And your question, when they see action coupled with support from senior management, they're excited and they'll engage. Yeah. If we don't support them, we've lost them. Yeah, well said. I think, I think we'll end on that note. Um, I can tell you that these companies are true partners and they see the world the way that we see it and it's really fun to work together to try and solve some of these things and we appreciate your partnership. Please thank all of these guys for their leadership. You're welcome. Nice job. Good to see you. You too. All right, that was outstanding, wasn't it? I think as you've seen today, we've taken some time to talk about what we, where we started, the three big initiatives. We've talked about some of the progress. We've talked about the people doing the work and a little bit of the glimpse of the future, some of the big challenges, and really talking with our partners about challenging all of us to take on some of these big areas of work and how we can all work together to really make a difference in this space. So we're gonna wrap it up with one final story in terms of really talking about what's next. And we want to highlight a team who's done something phenomenal. This team has taken on a challenge in sustainability in one of the most challenging areas of sustainability. They have taken it on themselves to drive change in their supply chain to actually uh, get to the first category in the US that will be 100% sustainability sourced. That's a big deal. They've also worked on Made in the USA and closed loop uh, within uh, their category. In addition to working on sustainability, Jan, they're also beginning to take on responsibility and looking deeper in the supply chain for the people and the social impacts of their supply chain. So we're gonna invite up the seafood team from Walmart US and Sam's Club and share a little bit about their work, congratulate them on their success. They offer a bit of a bridge to the future, connecting the work into a bigger agenda, and we're gonna have them close out with a cheer. So seafood team, come on up. There they are. All right, welcome. This is the group that's driven a lot of change, and we've got two of our leaders here. Mr. Baskin, I'm going to ask you to get a mic. How are you? Good. Bob, um, how are you guys? Uh, why don't you guys talk to us a little bit about what you've done, why this matters, and what you've really seen in your business? We talk a lot about uh, safe, affordable, sustainable programs, and if we can't defend things, then we have to do something about it. And so we looked at a lot of the things that we were doing, and there's frankly some things in our business that we just couldn't defend, whether it comes from people practices or um, you know, what they did with waste in the raw material. Um, it just mattered, and I'll tell you, this, this is the group that did it. You know, uh, They're the ones that are literally having tough conversations with suppliers um, to, to make them understand that this is what we're going to do, and we don't want to give up a billion dollar business, don't get me wrong, but we're willing to walk away from something if we can't defend it. And uh, I just, I think we're proud of the company that we work with. 
uh, and the people we work with to allow us to make those type of decisions. But we're going to draw a hard line on some of this stuff that we're just not going to put up with. So That's great. So Jan, tell us a little bit about what that means and kind of the context uh, around this challenge as we look to broader issues and sustainability from your point of view. Absolutely. You know, our customers and members expect to find great products at Walmart and Sam's Club, but they also expect that those products are both sustainably and responsibly sourced. You know, our vision is to drive responsibility in our supply chain and to lead and inspire others to do the same, and the seafood merchant and sourcing team has role modeled that. They became intently familiar with their supply chain from the input to the shrimp feed ingredients all the way to the finished product on the table. And then they used that knowledge, armed with that, to meet with each of their suppliers and leverage those strategic supplier relationships to work with responsible sourcing and to drive change in the industry and working along with the foundation as well. So what this shows is that you know, merchants can really embrace, and I thank you for embracing the great responsibility and opportunity that you have to use our purchasing power to drive change in the industry. And we think that is the future for responsibility. That's terrific. And how's your business? You guys selling any seafood? You know, we've got a brand new RTG seafood program that Trevor rolled out. It is absolutely phenomenal. I don't want to drive an item here, but you need to you try drive our, our fresh, never frozen seafood. You know where it comes from. You know what's in it. And it's fantastic. And we have price leadership. So Of course. I will tell do. you one thing, too. <laughs> no, one thing I have it. We'll be one of the first major retailers, Trevor and Denise, to be forced our BAP certified on our shrimp this year. So that's wow. what we're driving for. Again, we know where the feed comes from. We know the hatchery. You know who processed. Is that we know where the farm is, so we're excited about that. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And All also, right. this is great. Yeah. This is what good looks like. You guys are doing outstanding work. We're proud of you. Again, we're humbled by what you're doing. You're driving real change for customers, for members, for the business, for society, and we just love what you're doing. So with that, we're going to let you guys end with a cheer. One announcement as you're leaving, we've set up some display areas around the room. So if any of the stories you've heard today, you want to go deeper, you want to meet the people, you want to take a photo, you want to kind of go on Twitter, hashtag work that matters, come meet these guys, come learn more about what they're doing. There's different stations set up all around the room. Shake their hand and congratulate them for their work and learn more about some of the great things they're doing. We challenge each of you that's watching online at your desk, sitting in the room today, our suppliers, our associates around the world, keep it up. You guys are doing great work. This is the, uh, really about you and about the work you're doing to drive change for the company, to drive innovation, to help the business, help our customers, and make a, a really impact in the world. So awesome job. Thank you. David, who's doing the cheer? I'll do it. Let's get on our feet. Let's go. Jimmy W. W. A. L. L. Quigley. M. A. R. T. What's that spell? Walmart. Whose Walmart is it? My Walmart. Walmart. And who's number one? Always. Great job. Thank you guys.